And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, back to the Valley of the Judged. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra. And we, we, I have one, two, three of my good brothers here. As usual, we have good brother Ash, good brother Doku, and just and just arriving in the nick of time, good brother Zan. And this week we are going. We're this week. Well. To to rep to reference a bad to reference a bad line from both OSW and Clerks, my love for you is like a truck berserk. Yep, we are tackling the Berserker this week, which is basically the Barbarian in all in all but name. The Barbarian has had a it has had a interesting history over the years. It started out in. Unearthed Arcana in AD&D First Edition as a ver as a variant fighter, who for whatever reason ri had rules that illustrated that it really really hated using magic items. Um, and in fa in fact they could not use in fact the original barbarian in AD&D First Edition could not use any magic items and are compelled to destroy them if possible. Although they got access to to some to some magic to some magic items at certain levels, starting with potions at level two and culminating at most magic items available to fighters at level ten, which a fighter would already have by that point and then some. They no longer need to destroy the items, but but uh, most parties didn't want to keep barbarians around by the time it took to get to those thresholds. So. Because, because, well, I can't, I can't imagine why when one of, when they're compelled to smash loot, the, then they tried again with a kit in the complete fighter's handbook, which, all, which all that it did is put a plus, a plus three bonus to reaction rolls. Nobody used it. Um. They they try it again with um, the complete Barbarian's Handbook in Second Edition, and it lost a lot of it lost a lot of the First Edition powers. Maintained the D12 hit die, um, gained the ability to dual wield, and wasn't as restrictive. It also doubled down on the idea that Barbarians are from pre Iron Age approaches, but it wasn't received well either. Third edition is w once again is where a lot of what we understand of barbarians started to come about. Um, unca uncanny dodge, illiteracy, damage reduction, all that good stuff. Um, Three point five, they started to drop their empty levels. Even though, even though, even though one of the things they filled it with trap sense is um, kind of lame. <laughs> But they, but they ended up be, they ended up being considered tier four and basically a class that you dip into instead of one you dedicate yourself to. Um, Pathfinder and Pathfinder improved it by adding more trap sense, um, a rounds of rage per day, and rage powers. Even though even though some of them, <laughs> some of the ra some of the rage powers, cause some funny mental images. Like one of them allow giving you. A a situational bonus to swim checks, <laughs> rate, i.e., you spend one of your rages to get a bonus to swimming. Um, just picture that for a moment. <laughs> um, unfortunately, when the Blood Rager class came in, it kind of outclassed the Barbarian. They tried to fix it with Unchained, and um, it was more it was more of a ba it was more of a bandage. Especially since the Unchained Barbarian doesn't have any archetypes. Fourth edition is interesting because instead of going um, fighter who just gets really angry, they made it a primal class where your rages are you getting possessed by animal spirits. I found this kind. I actually found this kind of interesting. Um. 5e barbarians largely largely unchanged from 3.5 except rages are better I'd I'd say 
That and being able to add Constitution bonus to AC if you're not wearing armor, so you so you can be so you can um, be a be a half naked berserker while having the AC of a knight in full plate. Um, and rage only only applies to melee attacks, which is unfortunate. I want I want my angry archer. <laughs> Um, now the, now, um, that, with that said, that, br that, that brings, that brings us to the fact that in, in this particular instance, the, bar the, um, Berserker, for, and I'm not, I'm still not sure why they decided to call it that, but okay, has a, f there's always been, there's always been a few, um, bits of crit fishing, but with the but with the level up version there were some it, there were some interesting um tweaks now obviously the obviously if the core has had um has had br has had brutal critical even though it get even though it's clearly getting critical effects a lot earlier in level up than it did in core and one and um one thing i definitely find interesting is if you want to be a barbarian in armor, or rather a berserker in armor, you can because at first level you can you can pick um juggernaut instead of unarmored defense. Although I don't know, unarmored defense is still is still a bit on the raw and raw end of things. And Ash, you are mu you are muted. Indeed I am. I kind of uh, typing in, or highlighting, mm -hmm. for that matter. I got gotcha. you. Did you ask a question? I'm already starting to get um, uh, the inebriation is beginning to hit me. <laughs> um, I'm curious. Wait a minute, Ash. What... What did you turn into Doku? <laughs> I'm curious your th I'm curious your thought on the um, battle defense feature, where you can choose between either. Being being better at wearing heavy armor, or um, or get unarmored defense. I think it was clever. I think it shows, or maybe not clever. Um, how do I put this? I think they're dipping into multiple mechanical archetypes and saying, de loudly declaring that there are a few other martial archetypes which could potentially fit into this framework and could benefit from mechanical features like rage, which are not your topless savages running into running straight into Roman pikes. There are a few like the guy who's in super heavy armor running around the battlefield, uh, grabbing people by the scruff of their neck and smashing them into his own armor for fun and terror of the opponent. Um... Which I think is, I don't know if it's wise necessarily, or or stupid either. I don't, it's it's simply, I don't know, it's a connection I had not made before, and it's maybe a little ballsy, and uh, nothing, nothing wrong with it so far. I like the feature Juggernaut. You gain proficiency with heavy armor, in addition, your speed is not reduced by wearing heavy armor. And you do not count the weight of any worn armor when determining your carrying capacity. That's neat mechanical feature. I'd say it's a nice way to throw a bone to people who want who would want to try playing a character with rage, but don't want to do the half naked guy kind of thing. I say it's more choices rather than less, mm -hmm. and it's actually because you know if you chose barbarian in the past, the choice was. Barbarian or armored class. There, there was no in between. This, this allows you to be a little more versatile, and still, you know, if you want to be, be that crazy motherfucker who goes absolutely frothing mad on the battlefield, and also do so in heavy fuck off armor. Yeah. Um. And when it comes when it comes to when it comes to rage, there's a few there's a few things that I find I find um interesting about the di the difference between rages and in, in this case and rage and 
the and on rages normally. Now, both still have the whole advantage to strength um, checks and sa and saving throws. Um, both have both still have resistance to bludgeon, pierce, and slash. Um, let's see. They both have the um, whole whole thing with spe with spell restrictions. But what is di what is different in the level up version is gaining temporary hit points. Not just temporary hit points, a special exception for temporary hit points. Mm -hmm. It's normally temporary hit points don't stack, but in this instance, they say that the temporary hit points you gain while raging do in fact stack. Mm -hmm. Which how interesting. Yeah, now they don't, they, do you think that, you, now, they, in exchange, in exchange for having, in exchange for having that, um, escalating amount of, t of temp hit points, it seems that the thing that got dropped was the damage boost that Rages did in core. So I think, I think the vibe with this is that, is that Rages is more about, out, more about, um, about trying to outlast rather than rather than trying to rather than trying to hit the nuke. Right. Right. There's a defensive element, which is where, again, where these developing mechanics for archetypes beyond simply, you know, the, the topless savage are uh, are being given space. Mm -hmm. You know, it's just a, a, this super heavy warrior who can just continue lasting. Yeah. I don't have anything to say about Danger Sense, because it's basically the same thing as it was last time. Or, um, in, the, in Core. Um. Let's see. F as far as, f as far as Furious, cr as far as Furious Critical, that's, de that's definitely different. <laughs> um. In Core, they just had rec they just had Reckless Attack, which... Was a cent was just basically giving them advantage to me to melee attack rolls, but but it was basic for all intents and purposes. It was their own spit. It was a barbar. It was their own spin on power attack. <laughs> um. And while bar and while core barbarian does have some crit fishing effects, they um they don't get they didn't get that until much higher. Whereas in this case they're getting it at second and fourth level, and 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 every even every even level after that, and it's basic. And the majority of them are basically extra effects that happen when you when you crit. Um, were there any that you hi were there any that you highlighted on that, Ash? There is one. Uh... I guess restriction. It's anytime you crit with a melee weapon that has heavy two-handed or versatile. So it can't just be any crit. Mm -hmm. Right. Which which is includes more than you might expect, but does exclude some things that I feel it perhaps should not be excluded. It excludes your fist, and I'm sorry, but there are critical hits you can do with your fist that would absolutely make somebody vomit. Just go play Doom 2016 or Doom Eternal and do any <laughs> glory kill. Right, right. No, I was thinking, I was thinking more like uh, hand axes and stuff like that. But that's, I, I get where they're going with this. Um, actually, this this is sort of counter. This is why I was hesitant to give my stamp of approval to the idea of including additional mar martial archetypes in this, is because this is now excluding some martial archetypes and even some. Narrative archetypes. Uh, Kalam Makar from the Malazan series is basically this kind of uh, roguish berserker uh, combo, rogue barbarian combo, and things of that sort. And when he hits you, it doesn't matter that he's hitting you with a dagger. When he hits you with a dagger, he's uh, throwing you with it and stuff like that. The daggers are for his convenience, not his, uh, not something that he has to compensate for when it comes to tossing you around like a ragdoll. So this is this this is perhaps over exclusive, not do you not necessary. Do you think do you think that um 
Do you think that Furious Critical should have dro should have dropped the whole, the whole um, melee weapon that has heavy two handed or versatile? Just just that's that's fine. The stuff that people if people come up with things that are not going to fit the reason they fit in with those categories, the reason that they selected those to filter out the different melee weapons they'd be using is because they figured well pretty much everything is going to fit in here. Well, if everything's going to fit in there. People are going to do it on their own, except for the very few exceptions that people are going to come up with and now need to find some sort of mechanical workaround to instead of just leaving. It was already going to be an exception that people would do that. So you don't need to you don't need to create that filter. The, the, method, the methodology by which they identified that filter was the methodology by which people were already filtering their characters and just now they remove potential exceptions in a, in a silly go, and unnecessary fashion. I just go with attacks, period. And if if that's if that sounds unreasonable because you might end up with people using this for ranged attacks. Again, yeah, my, my my example of the Doom Slayer. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry. Now I can only imagine the Doom Slayer as an eternally raging berserk uh berserk ranger of some sort who goes into a super rage when he picks up the uh, berserk power ups. Um, right, it's it's yeah, it's um, I don't know. I I prefer, I prefer. I would definitely leave that for melee attacks only. But I would leave it for all given melee attacks, melee weapon attacks at the very least. Uh, mighty blow, not mighty glow. Sorry, uh, dazzling prowess was in particular. That's something I highlighted for uh, for show of martial skill is so stunning that the target can only gape. So you you know. <laughs> You send your sword through somebody, and they stare at it, open-mouthed, and, and just kind of unable to process what's happening to them. I thought, this is one of those... One thing that these developers do a fairly good job at, especially when they sort of turn loose and, and ignore more typical design constraints, uh, is developing scenes and pictures in your head into things that your character can just do given the given the appropriate you know opportunity or resource expended so for instance the the obviously the theme here is and they literally write the theme into everything and in, in a very um in a very short explanation, they don't take too long to get to it. They're like, all right, one lot, your show of martial skill is so stunning that the target can only gape, right? That's the flavor text of it. Everybody recognizes this. Everybody's seen this in a movie or in a TV show or something of that sort. We all get it. They get it. And they said, hey, here's a way you can just do that in game. Or here's a way that this can just happen to you in game. So I think it's cool. I think it's cool, and it, it it highlights the specific expertise of these designers. Mm -hmm. My counter argument for melee weapons as the only restriction: Prince Ashitaka from Princess Mononoke. Um, I'm sorry, but when his arm is infected and he gets angry, and it makes his bow much more powerful, and blasts a guy's head right off, and makes all the other guys scared, that it, it qualifies. <laughs> I'm okay with making that a. That's a sufficiently narrow band of uh, that's a sufficiently narrow band of, of narrative and mechanical archetypes that I'm okay with making that for instance an archetype or, or a subclass or something of that sort. I don't know if I would put it in. I'm fine with it being somewhere. I don't want it to be a, a part of the core class. Raging archer. <laughs> <laughs> Why not? Again, I could make the Doom Slayer that way. Yeah. I don't particularly care about the the Doom Slayer is not my uh, inspiration for developing <laughs> for developing. Um... I understand that. I'm, I just when it comes to someone who is fuck ass mad all the time and constantly killing things in the most gruesome, brutal fashions possible, my brain will automatically default to the Doom Slayer. And that is because the Doom Slayer is like the embodiment of fuck ass mad. Mm -hmm. Well, who else did? Who else did? Who else were you expecting it to be? Angron. Fuck Angron. He's a pussy. <laughs> mm -hmm. Um. Now, what I um, 
whenever I, when I've mentioned this before with some of the previous ones, but I'm all, but when it comes to the whole, some of them having the having a fifth level prerequisite, I'm always kind, I'm always kind of iffy on that sort of thing because my mindset is, are you really are you really doing enough to justify th that um, prerequisite? Uh, where for which one? Um, like for for example, oh, for and prowess. Uh, yeah, stun is something that you're gonna. When you're starting to get into conditions that usually only spellcasters are able to produce, um, waiting until. I mean, waiting until a uh, given level where spellcasters are able to produce those is probably a decent idea. Sets a tone in setting, but they, this goes back to implied setting. Uh, you know, once your once your mage is able to stun people and sort of keep them from doing anything, uh, it it comes right about the same time that maybe your martial character has access to it, but it's going to take longer, and they're not quite as good at it because this is more of a mental domain thing. I have a. I... I have a feeling that it's already locked behind a bunch of prerequisites to begin with, the first of which being a critical hit, uh, and then the second of which being someone failing the save against your... Against, it's a wisdom It's a wisdom saving throw they have to make, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, although most people playing Berserkers do not put much in the mental stats. They, use, they tend to use the mental stats as... Uh, Semi dump stats, like not super dump stats, like how well, some no, people. The, the target makes a wisdom saving throw. Uh, yeah, like, your DC like, is based off your constitution modifier. Ah, mm -hmm. uh, okay. Well, but then even, never mind. But, even with, but even, even then, even with that, um, the if if they want if they want to insist on having these kind of prerequisites, I would argue that in this in this case, there there's two. I would that um. Maybe it should take, and I'd probably end up doing this if I house rule it. Um, take a cue from the from the way critical attacks work in Thirteenth Age. It is still it, it is it is still it is still basically advantage on the attack, but if both if both count as just a regular hit, it's treated as a critical. Since five, um, it depends on the dice math of the system. That you might have trouble if you port that over. Uh, here, Pathfinder Second Edition might actually offer a, a better solution. Something that's a little bit more fitting for the dice math is if you get ten or over. Um, or yeah, yeah. I just, yeah, I just feel... over ten or over ten and above. Mm -hmm. How do I phrase that? Goodness, I'm going to give myself a stroke. <laughs> uh, that's gonna that's gonna fit in with the dice math, but point being, people are not going to get criticals all that often, and maybe I don't know. I don't like features that run off of criticals in systems in which you can get you have to roll like one number out of twenty in order to get a critical. I dislike that. Um, I fig I figure if the, if this is go if this is going to be working off of criticals, um. You need you need to either boost up the boost up the extra effects from that critical significantly, or make it or make it temporarily easier to get criticals. Like and what, the like latter solution, the obviously, region. being the easier because the the prior solution just causes so many problems. Mm -hmm. uh, in all elements, all facets of game design, you put a. All of a sudden, the the gap between different points of health and what you were trying to say about what a given character should be able to do and how they should be able to perform, it suddenly has this external space of possibilities that only happen where you're, you're able to roll a twenty, and that's just it's just a nightmare for designer and player alike. It's it's miserable. Mm -hmm. I dislike those effects. I'm okay with like Vorpal swords and stuff like that because that is like you no, know, you have a one in twenty ch percent chance to cut off somebody's head. The fact it's a critical hit is is sort of incidental to the fact that I'm giving you a one in twenty chance to cut no, off somebody's that. head, and that feels appropriate for the ability to cut off somebody's head. Yeah. Um, Snicker snack. Indeed. Mm -hmm. But not for like a for a weapon that like I don't know deals an extra seven damage. Hit or something. 
that's just like, oh, okay. Yeah, when it comes I have away, one in 20 chance to do seven extra damage. When you put it like that, gee, it sounds awful. I don't care about it. When it comes to when it comes to martial when it comes to um martial maneuvers, um I think we I think we've still ha we have we've had some issues with certain en entries when it comes to martial maneuvers, but overall we've overall we've found we've um I think found the inclusion of a martial maneuver system to be a net positive. Absolutely, very few duds overall. Mm -hmm. Um. Some duds concentrated around other classes more than other, or around one some thing, classes more than other. One thing that I hope the full book does uh -huh. is put, and, and if it doesn't, I'm probably going to make this myself. Is put in a, is put in a chart so that so that you can easily see what class gets what traditions. Since each yeah, is, that would be that would be handy. Just yeah. pop that in there. Um. Oh. But at the beginning, at the, I would, uh, if that were the way that it was going to happen, it'd be best to separate the classes lists by, uh, melee that, or any class that gets mar martial, pro uh, martial archetypes and martial, uh, standards and, and the maneuvers versus the casters who don't. And then just put that chart at the beginning of the section with all well, of the with people who with... it. With casters, in with casters, there's already a spell list that gives a short version of of what spells they have at each spell at each spell level. Yeah, just put a put a something, mm -hmm. something or other, um, a thing. I, now it's it. Now with versatile exploration, it does it does make the note about how you can shoot how you can. When choosing um, new exploration acts, you can pick, you can dip into the fighter exploration act as well. I'd, um, I'm okay with that, but I'd also possibly double into giving, into allowing them to pick from the rangers acts as well. Um, that's just that's just me though. I'm not, I'm not sure if you, I'm not sure if you think that if any, of, if either of you think that. It should be purely um, barbarian or fighter nax, or um, we can, th or the ranger should be thrown in as well, given the motif. I'd have to take another look at the ranger nax. I can think of some that would fit in, mm -hmm. and it doesn't look seem like they're shying away from the yeah primal presence and stuff like that. I, it's not they're not quite shying away from it. I, I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. They might be trying to develop some some internal divisions that. They don't want these two things to. Mm -hmm. mix with. All right, and um, no worries, do no worries, Doku. Stay frosty, man. So later, everybody. If I could help, I would, but uh, never played a berserker, so yep. never played a barbarian outside of my wheelhouse. So have fun. All right, um, all right, peace, buddy. Peace, guys. So at third level, we have the options between agitate, fearsome reputation, and inspiring prowess. Um. Were there any that were there any in those three that you highlighted? Imposing prowess. Let's see. When an ally, but, uh, you can see. But, but no, I was I was mm -hmm. I was just kind of correcting the fact that you said inspiring. Yeah, I don't I don't know why I said that. Fearsome reputation. I like that in particular. Mm -hmm. Uh, actually, most of these are pretty. Yeah. All right, so fierce. Let's go over fearsome pre reputation. By now, most people are familiar with with my particular standards for social abilities. Mm -hmm. I do not want to get a higher result on the roll. I want a specific reaction or situation to be produced by virtue of my character having this ability or failing to use it properly or succeeding in using it properly. Right? I want a specific. I want to be able to invoke. An event at the table, much like I would be able to do with any other ability. Not interested in just getting a higher number. So with Fearsome Reputation, word spreads of your prodigious strength or how terrifying you can be in battle. Whenever you are in a settlement, at least one commoner approaches you with a modest gift or bride. Bribe. Uh, it could be a bride. Eh. Depends on how modest the bride. Then it could be a gift. Uh, and or... 
forces you to help settle a feud, move a large obstacle, or otherwise make use of your impressive might. In addition to their offering, they're eager to tell you about their home and neighbors. This is awesome. Yeah. I was going to say Imposing Prowess is one that you wouldn't like, because all it does is uh, give an expertise die to a, a uh, an ally that fails a, a deception or persuasion check. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I look at that, I'm like, alright. Imposing Prowess didn't really impress me. The two the two that I find the most... And um, agit- I'd say of the th- of the three, fearsome reputation is the one that has the biggest thumbs up. Agitate, I like up until the last sentence. Is that the GM's discretion? No, what the no. creature does. No, once you've used this feature, oh, you can do so again tr- until you finish a short or long rest. Ah. You guys already know how I feel. How I feel about the rest system in Five E that hasn't changed. How, how we all feel, yes. Mm-hmm. This is one of those things where the the language of scene or barring that encounter uh, would be more effective. I like games. I'm coming to continually appreciate games which use the word scene, and I'm noticing it both in old school and new school games. Like Lancer is very clearly new school. They use the word scene. Mm-hmm. Worlds Without Number uh, uses the phrase scene, and that's an old school game. And Rabancho Zero does it as well. It's a scene is becoming a more and more is becoming it's, a continually effective it's marker not, yeah, it's unit not, of time. It's um it's not as new school as a lot of people think because I was seeing that all the way back in my early days with with um old world of darkness. Yeah. Scene is big in, in old world of darkness, but that's also because you know, whole system is called the storyteller system. Yeah, yeah World of Darkness is, is a little that's old school era. I don't know if I I don't know if I would call that old school itself. I I haven't um, played it, so can't. It de- it very much de- it very much de- the problem the problem with you the problem with using once once you're going outside of the D twenty based bubble, what counts as old school and new school becomes a lot more muddled, and also in many cases a lot less relevant. Yeah, um, I don't know. Probably comparing Lancer to Mech Warrior, BattleTech, or something like that, so it would be more effective. No. Um, sure. When you are like new school versus old school. No, no. The pro- no. The problem is, the problem is they don't. There is not a whole lot of. There's not a whole lot of event of a Venn diagram between Lancer and and BattleTech. They're apples to oranges. But I'm getting ahead of myself. Um, well, you know my proficiency is comparing different design strategies and stuff like that, and that's where I go. That's where I developed the new school versus old school criterion. Um, so, like worlds without dark, worlds worlds without Ash, darkness. My goodness, Ash Ray, Rails. Yeah, no, no, this is Rails. This is trust me, this is relevant. When we're setting up things like markers, like scenes and stuff like that, uh, whether or not it's old school or new new school, it's the the point being is that it's a more effective unit of play, or seems like a more effective unit of play as time goes on. So, and this is an area where maybe they should have dive, dive, divulged? No. Um, diverted? No. No, what am I thinking of? Split off from 5e. And gone and from the mess system to scenes. Or they should have diverged. Yeah. Diverged, thank you. No, no problem. I, I can I can tell that the uh, the you've become uh, too much like Doku right now. Ah, yes, the inebriation continues. Um, Way of Wrath, obviously, we're skip we're skipping right now. That's that's basically that's basically the um, subclass setup. We'll get to that later. And the same applies when it comes to ability score improvement. Um, Everybody knows what an ASI is. Yep. Um, crushing bl- crushing blows. So that's that's um that's basically improved that's basically improved critical at fifth level. Let me see what was and at fifth and then level, again at twelfth. Yeah, um, that's replacing that's replacing extra attack. Um, fast movement is ba- is baked into unarmored defense. It's not replacing extra attack because extra attack yeah, is also just, a Yeah, you just get it. Yeah, both yeah, these you things. Do get, yeah, you do get it. Sorry about that. So, extra. Att- so, extra. So instead of 
So instead of fa instead of getting fast movement at fi at fifth level, which would have which would have just um, increased your speed, um, the speed increases you're getting that by default if you've if you picked unarmored defense at first level. Um, mm -hmm. I'm I'm fine. W I'm f I'm fine with um with with a with expanding critical and and. Having uh, I really eases most of our complaints about the earlier critical hits. It bandages them a little bit, but oh, but not not as far not as far as I would have liked. Um, moving on to primal presence, which is again we ha again we have a set setup like we had before, so we have forceful, mighty, and scary. All of these have really good social hooks. Mm -hmm. um, to be honest. I think out of them, I like forceful most, simply because you just are. You, you you do a thing, and people follow you, and you you don't have you don't even have to roll for it. With, with mighty, you make a DC fifteen intimidation check in a tavern or other social gathering. And they're like you're like, hey, tell me where this guy is. And everybody's like, it's over there. Like just a bunch of people point that way or tell you where he is. Um, and scary it's into the domain game as well, which is which is particularly delicious too. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Is every time, all right, I'm I'm gonna case this area to conquer it and stuff like that. Oh, look at that! I already, I have an entourage of helpers to any place I go, and maybe I decide I want. Yep. Win over some of the people before I kill them. Yep. And then scary, I find to be the the least useful because it's additional social pressure is extremely specific it's like you fail deception check it then is forced to make a wisdom saving throw against your passive deception score uh and then on a failure your failure became becomes a success like it's, it's basically a re-roll they just disguised it be some behind one other person doing the re-roll <laughs> It's a, it's a re-roll on the on the account of the of the person you already failed against, right? And then it's they have to roll higher than whatever your passive deception score is, like a contested to uh, con contested contested roll to a set DC. Mm -hmm. It's 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 my least uh. It's my least favorite. It's also the one that says you can use con for deception checks. I'm like, hey, but I don't really use deception checks that much. Most people don't. Um, most people would rather go intimidation than deception. Right, let, let me let me check some. Let me scroll up and check something because I want to see what skills they. Have. Um, the odd thing is, the only way you'd be the only way you'd be getting deception as a as as a skill is if you got it as a background or as part of a feat. Deception or as part of it, uh, heritage. Yeah, deception. It, deception is not a class skill. Yep, this is this is why forceful is my favorite. Mm -hmm. I'm guessing forceful is probably your favorite too, there, Ash. Uh, if I had to compare, yeah, I think it is forceful because, like I said, it's the domain game. Anything that any kind of individualized character abilities which which have sort of bridged the gap between that and other modes of play are just bread and butter for me. Yeah. Um, Especially if those modes of play are, are well supported in the game. But even if even in cases like this, even if there is no domain game inherent to the level up play test, I mean this it's just a cool ability to have. So something that ticks that many boxes for me, come on. Mm -hmm. I, gotta, I can't with, help but love that. Stack forceful with fearsome rep reputation, and suddenly the bribe really could be brides. Yeah. The followers that follow you are all the bribes, that, and they're all brides. <laughs> that, that, right. That uh, gonna... I mean, you don't I... normally see... In 5th edition, it's, it's hard enough to get, like, t sort of tactical combat combinations and stuff like that, things that stack up on one another to produce even cooler effects once you once you combine the two they go something that becomes more than its component parts it's difficult to get that in combat in fifth edition 
here they don't even they do it more than just in fifth edition they also do it for the the social element like i said this is this is where these designers really shine mm -hmm. i i am thoroughly impressed yep um evade looks like evasion is replacing feral instinct um feral instinct just gave you advantage on initiative and um and some defense against surprise as long as lo saying if you're since it was if you're surprised at the beginning of combat and you're not in incapacitated you can act normally on your first turn but only if you enter rage which um feel like I feel like that's a that's one two, the whole having to having to enter rage for, first when it comes to that seemed kind of odd but instead we have well, having to and it's it's an opportunity to they're incentivizing it. it. It's, it's. Let me put it this way. I know that that sounds like it's moving in one direction for the player, but it's, it's moving in the opposite direction. It's saying basically, you can only use this ability provided you have a rage available to you. And anybody who's who's getting surprised by the enemy is probably going to pop rage. So it's more like you give them an opportunity to rage early, and you get these other benefits in addition to that. But only so long as you have rage available is the uh, the sort of resource timer on it. It sounds like a restriction, but it's actually these bonus opportunities to use it. It's just the way that the language is sort of organized that it sounds like a restriction. Mm -hmm. Um, but in, instead you have you get evasion. So when doing a de when doing a deck save that would do half damage, you just take no damage and half damage on a failure. Stand, standard fare for the ev for evasion rules. Yep. Mm hmm. Um, I'm not sure how I feel about Battle Moxie. Yeah, with Battle Moxie, we once again have another choose one of three. In this case, provoking attitude, roaring pause, and take one to no one. Um, it. I can't say. I can't say. Maybe it's just maybe it's just how it's presented, but it feels like take <laughs> take one to no one is a little bit incomplete. I mean, when you see a creature, you know if it is proficient with more than simple weapons, or has access to combat maneuvers. Yeah. Um, I think it's the fact that they didn't put a period in it. It makes me think that was that supposed was that supposed to be that short, or did somebody um f did somebody screw up? I would add one. I would probably add one line to taste one to no one, and it would be it would be actually quite simple. Uh, when a creature uses a maneuver against you, or when a creature you can see within range of your weapon, melee weapon, we'll put the additional stipulation on mm -hmm. some sort of range and basically restriction, uh, you can use that maneuver on your next attack by expending. You know, an expertise die or is. They're having them. The, these ones have uh, the other two have them expending a, a rage. Oh, perfect rage! That's right. That's right. Is it? Both? I thought it was only provoking attitude. No, no you're right. Attitude roaring attitude and pause. and roaring pause. Mm -hmm. uh, of the two that make you expend a rage, I think roaring pause is the more useful one, mm. simply because. If you manage to make that intimidation check, and you've, for example, chosen mighty. Uh, back in Primal Presence, where you can, you know, use Constitution when making intimidation checks. Uh, so DC eight plus the number of creatures that rolled initiative. So you got, say, let's say you're 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 this is level nine at this point. Let's say you're against a a group of six, you know, fairly challenging baddies. So you got a DC of fourteen. And you roll, you know, your your you you roll, and if you succeed, uh, they stop what they're doing and can only make statements and a deception, intimidation, or persuasion check on their turn. And that's each creature, so you know that's going to be even your own uh, your own allies at that point. But then if you succeed by more than five, you get to choose a number of creatures equal to your con mod to gain advantage on their initiative for the next initiative table when it's re-rolled. Mm -hmm. hmm. Yeah. 
if I if I was building it if I was building a berserker and I had to pick between the two, I'd probably I'd probably go with Roaring Paws. Yeah, it's like the ability to piss someone off so that they come and challenge you. I that just, that just seems like a kind of a waste of spending a rage to do so. Just I could roll, o- I could only see. It. You know the you know what's the funny thing? If this was if I was if if this was say the for, the four E fighter and I was using the ra- I was using the rage I was using the um, marking rules for the tank for the defender classes, mm-hmm. provoking attitude would become a whole lot more useful. Yeah. If I was if I was to play a more social character, which I can see myself doing in this system, uh, provoking attitude would be my go to. But that's just I think it I think it does meet the threshold for like, all right, we're producing because it meets my it meets my qualifications. Yeah. The nature of this challenge is at the GM's discretion, but is usually a dual or opposed check. You're producing a specific situation a the- special ability. It's like, all right, well I would I there's probably a bunch of encounters I could use this for and a uh and a resource. So if, especially if I'm in town, that's gonna be great for like shopping sessions and stuff like that. The, the issue I have with it is it's something that can very easily be replicated entirely through role-playing. Many of these things can, but the, the value of the provoking attitude is that you can just... You can do it. Mm-hmm. Um, <clears throat> now, when it comes on a to... Failure, cause on a failure, it makes or accepts a challenge. Yeah. That's not something that you can necessarily just do through roleplay. I mean, you could theoretically do it through roleplay, but you would have no way of forcing that outcome through role. Didn't you? Didn't you write a piece about the about the whole do it do it through roleplay attitude not too long ago, Ash? Uh, why can't the GM just decide? S- something. Something. I like it was that. called "Why Can't the GM Just Decide." It might have been. It definitely wasn't. Uh, I don't care what GMs say about improvisation. Definitely wasn't. I don't care what GMs say about rewards. Yeah, can't the GM just decide? Mm-hmm. So yeah. So so when real designers determine they want something to, in some way to debut in a game, they make it a feature of the game. They don't just leave it blank. Yes, the GM can decide to implement that feature, but the GM can implement lots of features, and they could choose to do so based on time, preference, perceived reception at their table. Perceived competence in making the feature functional and entertaining, but you know, if you want them to prioritize one thing over another, put it in the game. Yeah. So, for instance, the social social abilities and stuff like that. Lots of these can be replicated through role play, but if you want the player to be able to force this situation, which is why you give them abilities to begin with, you pop it in the game. Mm-hmm. Um. Now, with the last thing before we get before we get into the before we get into the subclass special, is um, exploration knacks because they put, obviously they put that in the back. Um, we've got five total: lead the pack, mark of the wilderness, path of lean winters, path of scorching summers, and sharpened senses. <laughs> Um, hmm. of these, some of some of them, I, I, I look at and ju- and just go, oh, just go, okay. Um, Arc of the wilderness and sharpened senses are just the whole add a die to it to do stuff things. Yeah, those are kind of eh. I like lead the pack most actually. Yeah, because it, again, it it plays into uh, plays into the berserker. You're this That's a theme to it at the very least. Yeah, you're this stalwart, unbending badass who's like, "Come on, let's all do this." Mm-hmm. And they're like, "God damn, I want to be like that guy." And so when they're like, "I want to be like that guy," and you're jumping and running over shit, and y'all got to do it together, you get to go, "Hey, that guy in the back there, that squishy wizard type, um, I'm gonna make my die roll." Also, his die roll. Everybody else can roll too, and you can actually declare it at any point before the GM d- declares success or failure. So you could actually see what everybody rolls. Pick whoever has the lowest roll. That isn't you, unless you have the lowest roll, in which case, you know, mercy on your soul or whatever. Mm-hmm. 
and just go, okay, yeah, you guy who's likely to drag us down to failure, yeah, you have my score too now. So, uh, yeah. You get to plug holes. Yep. You get to be the, 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 the saving grace. I think t I think Tanner would appreciate that kind of thing, given his, given his um, setup. Um, but that brings uh, that of course brings us to this to the subclass special. So you ready for this, Ash? Uh, mostly, mostly. All right. Now, of course, the, now of course, if we want to be pedantic. It's primal paths, but again, if it walks like a duck and talks like a duck and quacks, um. So I'll start at the t so I'll start at the top. Usual rules apply as always. Um, Path of the Berserker. Uh, Path of the Berserker. That's the uh, that's the not uh, totem. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, thumbs in the middle. Berserker is sort of uninteresting. Most people don't touch it. Yeah, it's but these guys have a maneuver system. They have a. They have they they have access to everything that they when it comes to making that particular subclass interesting. Uh, thumbs in the middle. Mm -hmm. It's not something. It's certainly not so. I've never seen anybody at my table use it. The only real the only real bonus I I've ever seen out of Path of the Berserker is um is fr is fr is frenzy. Which it which um combine that with extra attack that's you're get you're getting um you're getting bo you're getting bo you're getting um bo you're get you're getting potential potentially three attacks in a in a go um right the problem being of course that most people have the most people pick up the great weapon master feat with this particular yeah class so that ends up getting getting wasted um totem warrior thumbs up. No commentary, just a great subclass. Yep. Thumbs up. Totem Warrior is the one where one of the totems basically makes you take half damage from every type of damage source except like psychic, right? Yeah. Except let's get yeah. let's get a little specific with the to with the totems. Um, uh oh. Since wolf. Thumbs up. Gives you gives allies advantage on giving attacks and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. uh, I doubt that they would go with minor advantage as opposed to. Major advantage because as the subclass, as these documents go on, I'm noticing that language uh, featuring less and less. Yeah, I, yeah, I'm I'm noticing less and less of advantage in general. Yeah, I do I do remember saying in the early when Five E came out fairly early that advantage was going to be treated like a um, get get out of design free card. And I think I think history has largely borne me out. Um. Third party notwithstanding, of course. Um, bear. Uh, thumbs up. That's the everything but psychic damage one. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's 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 the best. Yep. The bear totem is basically, oh, I'm raging, and I have extra damage, and you can only do half damage to me unless there happens to be someone with psychic damage. Mm -hmm. Well, this is unfortunate for you. Yep. Um, eagle. Thumbs. Nah. Thumbs down. Eagle's boring. I never. I don't mean anybody who plays eagle. Eagle is which one again? Um, I, I can't remember. That's what I'm doing. <laughs> thumbs down. I play it with a wolf totem. I actually prefer playing with it. Somebody gets a wolf totem in there. You have a bunch of melee fighters, and just suddenly everybody is hitting all of their attacks, and they're critting about two or three times as often. It's, it's a, eagle. Eagle gi Eagle gives you a bonus action dash and makes attacks of opportunity less likely to hit you. Um, it oh, also gives right. Eagle Vision so you can see, you can see a mile away and fly while raging. Uh, thumbs thumbs down. There could be something interesting where the Path of the Eagle gave you access to additional maneuvers from other classes like uh, Biting Zephyr mm -hmm. or maybe Mist and Shade, if, which are of course my two favorites. <laughs> So that's that's maybe where I might consider yep. yeah, a particular thing, because you would actually be able to use those maneuvers somewhat more often. Mm -hmm. But uh, tangent aside, yeah, thumbs down. Yep. Um, the circumstances under which they make that interesting are too narrow. Yep. Um, elk. 
thumbs up. I believe this is the one that had something of a charge attack to it. I remember being impressed. I haven't seen it in game, but I remember being impressed by the text of it and sort of the first inkling that this we were is going. The, this is the one that could let you overrun people while raging. I.e., you could char you could charge and just keep going. Yeah, yeah. I see. I knew it had something to do with charge attacks. Yeah, thumb thumbs up. I was impressed by that. Um, it's going to have great synergy with the rest of these. Tiger. Thumbs in the middle. I can't remember. That was the one that was a little bit more of like a basically sort of copying a lot of the mechanical text for pounce attacks. Jump good. <laughs> that, that, is that is Tiger Totem. Jump good. Yeah. Yeah. And that's so that's, you know, thumbs in the middle. Could make that interesting. Could be some synergy. Might be boring. Who knows? Yep. You can fly. No. Jump good. <laughs> exactly. Um, Battle Rager. Battle Rager, uh, I could, can, I can give this a thumbs in the middle. It's weird. I don't see why it would have any particular difficulty synergizing with the rest of the content here. It would just be weird. Yeah, especially... especially and also Forgotten it's... Realms, and therefore deserving of bullying. <laughs> um, there's... Oh... I think I think that I think that it's ki that it's that a bit that a problem that it's going to have is one of its one of its main one of its main um one of its one of its main advantages is getting temp HP except when you're raging with let with the level up version you're going to get temp HP anyways um and that temp right. and that temp HP is going to come off a lot better than than what Battle Rager that and you have the whole bullshit that you've got to wear a specific kind of armor, which um, I... I mean, if you're going to make a subclass around wearing a specific kind of armor, it's a subclass around wearing a specific kind of armor. That's just it. That, that comes with the territory. Nobody's going... Nobody's going... Let me put it this way. Nobody's going to pick that thing and, and get tricked by the designers into playing something that they didn't expect. You are... You pick that subclass, you are 100% responsible... For wearing that armor doesn't mean that doesn't mean I have to like their choice on that front. I know why or they did it. I just don't like it. Busters. Right. Um, Ancestral guardian. Ooh, big thumbs up. God, this is such a that is, that is such a fun subclass. Hmm. Uh, it works. I would. This is another situation in which I would like to see magical or mystical or, or some other some different category of. Maneuvers available, which are sadly looks like they're not based on the Ranger uh, document that we looked at. It looks like they're not going to be going that route. Yeah. But if they were to go that route, uh, Ancestral Guardian would be a prime candidate for it. Fantastic mechanical fodder. Additional exploration acts could be could be mined from it based on the idea that you know your ancestor instead of you leading the pack, it's your ancestor leading pack instead of your you being forceful when you enter a settlement it's your ancestor doing so when you reach a crypt or something of that variety just yeah. so much so much there's, to just mine there there's also the fact that the um the level up barbarian is has a has a bit more le has a bit more leaning into the tanky end of things as we talked about and ancestral guardian is a very tanky subclass yeah it's a, it also involves like i think if i recall correctly extending but basically your ages around to uh, other party members, depending on the, your chosen effect. Like I said, just very mechanically solid, absolute gold mine when it comes to theme and mechanics. It's, it, it's fantastic. Yeah. Um, Storm Herald. Storm Herald. Uh, uh, thumb, thumbs in the middle. Storm Herald. Um... Storm Herald, so Storm Herald is cool, especially narrative. Mechanically, it suffers from a few like no, small number interactions. A lot of Xanathar's Guide to Everything subclass editions had this, where they were like, "All right, well, do this thing, and then you deal some amount of damage, which, based on the level that you get this at, and are probably playing, uh, going to end the campaign at, is going to do something." under 10 damage to people in a area around you or it's going to produce some other minor effect to people in an area around you stuff that just like slows the game and doesn't actually have much an event much of an impact even in 
multiple rounds of combat, it just it just has a nullifying effect on the action and the speed at which things progress. Mm-hmm. I remember the Storm Herald suffering particularly from that. Some of the options you got were not like some of the desert stuff was actually okay with that. Yeah. Some of some of the stuff was like des- you know uh, difficult terrain, and sometimes you're provoking. Constitution saving throw. So thumbs in the middle. It need it needs some cleanup, but it's a cool subclass. Mm-hmm. Cool subclass, but it needs to be cleaned up. Um, zealot, i.e., man literally too angry to die. Oh, uh, thumbs thumbs up. Zealots, zealots a lot. Mm-hmm. That's a lot of fun. Didn't actually get the kind of treatment I felt it should have in fifth edition, and that's not like I know that's my uh, old man beats dead horse or whatever. Let's see. Old man yells at clouds in sky. Yeah, old old man yells at clouds. I think, I think there's enough narrative fodder there to make it interesting. So thumbs, I don't know. Thumb, thumbs in the middle. Actually, there wasn't. There's not as much to mine off of the zealot, especially not mechanically. Narratively, you got some more there. Yeah. Um. But I it's ambiguous th- enough that you might just toss it into a different class. I think I think the you might f- just toss it into Paladin. Paladin can get revived for free without having to spend, you know, you just have to spend the spell slot. You don't have to do the material components. Like, that could just... I don't know. Mm-hmm. Um, Wild Soul. Thumbs uh, down. Only account of the shitty and embarrassing art that featured... Next to it, in Tasha. <laughs> uh, only for that reason. Uh, no. Um, thumbs in the middle. Wild Soul is, is a bit of a weird subclass, and as with most weird subclasses, translating that to a different system, translating something which is a system out of a system into another system is going to have some weird interactions, and they need to be better scrutinized and the wild soul the wild soul is like interesting to me because it's another one of these things where it's like i don't know if there is a narrative archetype that this is drawing on necessarily i think this is a new mechanical archetype that you can draw from but i don't know how much i don't know Um, know. i'm not as familiar with the wild soul as i would like to be it is it is it is i played real quick and i played with somebody who ran that barbarian um, Wild Soul to me comes off as something akin to, akin to an attempt to bring the Blood Rager from Pathfinder into 5e. Um, hmm. But when it comes to when it comes to the, I think it I think it um, triples down a little bit on the whole, on the whole Wild Magic thing. Um, it's a little bit better at managing it though. Uh, I was more like, all right, well, these things might be an inconvenience to you and your party. But that's mostly going to be a matter of circumstance, and you can alter those circumstances so that they're more beneficial to you. They don't do things like turn you into a flower pot because the yeah. designer just troll you. You know. Um, lastly, what do, you, what do you think if you had like blood magic or or martial maneuver or sorry magical maneuvers in the system? This would probably be a little bit easier to incorporate, right? There's like a special list mm-hmm. of of things within this other system that already exists. Yeah, um, I think I, th- I don't, s- I haven't seen people pick Wild Soul all that o- all that often with Core, and I can't see that happening with the level up version. Um, yeah, it's lar- the other problem. Th- the uh, and the other problem is that it, as much as as much as it's going to try and sim- Wild Soul is going to try and simplify it, um, you are still gimm- you are still adding a gimmick on gimmicks. Um, yeah. I think I think narratively the idea the idea of some the idea of somebody's rage being empowered by wild magic um I like that narratively but something like wild soul needs a rewrite um, probably no matter what it, it turns out to be it's probably still going to be niche is my guess what do you what do you guys think yeah wild magic wild magic has always been a bit of a tough sell and it's one that I only really use in in specific. Um, settings. Maybe that's a good thing. I mean, druids are by the by the D and D Beyond 
statistics at least of a few years ago like they're pretty niche and stuff like that but you didn't you, you didn't you, you didn't mind having a druid in the party because druids are cool it's just they're they're a little bit weird so not everybody knows them. um i think it's i i get the feeling a lot of the pick rate on D D beyond is people preferring si um simplicity and simplicity when it comes to the, when it comes to their kit i regret to inform you that's probably most that's probably most YV players yeah um uh, there's definitely there is definitely a bias in favor of like well let me see how this thing works let me create human fighter mm -hmm. and stuff like that but but then again a lot of people just do that to a lot of people who are like sort of lowest common denominator when it comes to RPGs they yeah. just they just do that in most games anyway except in games which don't let them do that last is Path of the Beast did this make it in or was this an unfair con I think this made it in this made it into Tasha's didn't it. Yeah, it's it. Yeah, it's in Tasha's. Uh, well, given that I don't like the the level up druid, I feel like I, I almost feel like I have to give this a thumbs down by proxy. I <laughs> I mentioned before that I I like the I I like the level up druid. The path of the beast, if you recall, is basically um like is basically being a lichen. Um. Yeah, it has some. It has some. And, and given that they already tried to, with druids, they tried to solve problems that didn't necessarily, that maybe did exist, but they they took a hammer to things that maybe needed a little bit more surgical pre precision. God damn it, Zan! Got him. Um, uh, this is the song that I posted in chat, it's a reference <laughs> to Neon Genesis Evangelion and one of the most brutal scenes in the anime. I, um, yeah, that was rough. Yeah. I would, personally, Path of the Beast would get a, would get a thumbs in the middle. It's, it, it's not a better or a worse, it's, it's just adding, it's just adding a trick to your rages. I think it, I can only see, I can only see Path of the Beast getting played by people who already have some sort of narrative archetype they're working with in mind. Spe yeah, like this person is basically a lycanthrope, and we're trying to represent that in mechanical terms. So this yeah. is our this is our go-to. This is one of those things that, that probably doesn't belong in a... Path of the Beast is one of those things that probably doesn't belong in a class-based system, or certainly not something that, that's like restrictive classes. Uh, you could put that... I mean, hell, I, I could put Path of the yeah. Beast in Worlds Without Number, because it would just be uh, one of the... Foci. It would be a focus that you could spec into, among other things. Um, so, but 5th edition has this problem where, like, alright, well, some of these subclasses that we're coming up with are gimmicks. So we have to make a, a a progression out of a gimmick. And sometimes, so sometimes what that means is because this gimmick was too cool for low levels, alright, we're going to make a progression out of a gimmick, and you're not going to get really access to that gimmick until, like, 10th or 14th level. So you're just going to be kind of, you're going to feel kind of basic bitch, uh, especially compared to anybody else playing this class, because they just got the cool character-defining things, and character shows where they think, they, they get to identify where they diverge from the core character class at specific and way earlier levels that they're actually going to play through, and the gimmick characters don't actually always do, get to do that. Uh, that's a huge problem with Wizards of Vision. Mm -hmm. Is I'm I'm just a wizard. It's just uh, once I get to like 14th level or whatever, I can actually do cool shit with very few exceptions. Yeah. Um, so what you're telling me is this uh this this subclass is a is a rage that transforms you into a a rabid beast that is more brutal than usual. My meme song still applies. It. Which is what? Which is why? Which is why I gave you the damn it treatment. But overall, <laughs> um, I think if there's any major takeaway from from the way Level Up is treating the barbarian, it's the fact that the five. I'd say the core five E barbarian had a theme, had a theme of of um ev of everything geared toward toward melee offense. Um, and trying trying to do the most um, trying to trying to be as trying to be a bit more nova y in some cases. Um there's still there's still a bit of there's still a bit of that. Time will tell how, how Nova E it'll get and how um how it's gonna modify rages at higher levels. 
but I do like that. I do like that. There's the op. The biggest takeaway is that there's the option for more defensive-oriented barbarians instead of bar instead of it being all about offense. Yeah, that probably is the biggest point of divergence. And the is is there they're leaning into? I mean, Juggernaut was your first clue into it. It's like yeah. suddenly. Yeah, you, you could be heavily armored. It's so weird how that one inclusion of like, all right, well, instead of unarmored defense, you could choose this other thing. And, and suddenly everybody started thinking of different characters, like that one guy from the Joan of Arc movie who's just running around with those big spiky plates and he smashes an Englishman's face into one of them. Yeah. Just screaming. Um, what, I see th what, I see, what I see in this, in this kind of thing is... And it is an acknowledgement that, as much as much as there's the meme of of characters like He Man or Conan the Barbarian being pow being powerful swords being powerful warriors who did not exactly believe in clothing, if you look if you look at the way Co if you look at the way Conan um had his get had his get up throughout the throughout both the Marvel and um and Dark Horse and Dynamite comics, um that was that's not always the case with him. There's plenty of th you can find plenty of art throughout those comics where he was in armor. Yes, but most people when they think Conan think uh Arnold in booty short. Yeah. And it's for th it's for th but the but there's been plenty of bar there's been plenty of barbarians that di that were you that were using ar that were using armor in some form, even if it was just hide. Uh, uh, I'd like to go into the. Uh, I'd like to go into some of the pulps and stuff like that. I'd like to run through Appendix N and see if any of those guys were. I suspect Kothar the Barbarian might have been on. I gotta go look at that. Yeah, possibly. But o overall, I do. I do. Th I think the Barbarian is going to is going to entry is going to go down as a case where. Um, a f where minor changes have major implications. I mean, apparently, that's the... In a fashion that I don't think any of us were expecting. Mm -hmm. Was the was the funny thing. And, yeah. Jeez. But, I think, I think that'll... Now, unfortunately, next week we won't be able to do the sub the subclass hour because because this because this is going to be our first one hundred percent new class. Well, but that gives us a chance to do a subclass theory hour. Yeah, what is what is that class? Um, do you remember? Do you remember how? Do you remember how I bitched about the about? The um b about what I thought the battlemaster was. That's going to be important next week, because next Ooh. next week is next week is the warlord, which means I get to talk about the fourth edition warlord next week. Oh boy! <laughs> which is a good thing because I love the fourth edition warlord, and now you'll it's get to see what now you'll get to see why I ha why I was so why I was so annoyed when the when the um, successor to that to that warlord is a fighter subtype. That being the battlemaster. And yeah, I'm gonna have to I'm gonna have to do the maneuver dice rant for the umpteenth time, but that was inevitable. Mm. So that that's that's what we'll that's what we'll have in mind for next week. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present. My name is Mildra. I am your gaming monk. Stay fucking frosty, everybody.